How's everybody doing today? Good to see you. Thank you for coming out and joining us as we continue our summer series, Heroes and Sidekicks. We have our pastoral staff scattered across the Capital Region today. Pastor David's preaching at Northside. Pastor David is in the hood. Pray for David. Uh, He's preaching at Northside this morning. Pastor Eric is up in Saratoga doing worship and preaching up there. And as the summer uh, rolls on, we're going to kind of all make our way through the circuit and preach at the other campuses as well. Pastor John and Pastor Dan, in addition to David and Eric, will be here as well. So you get to catch up with them if you haven't seen them in a while. But we're all doing the same thing. We're preaching our Heroes and Sidekicks series, really taking a look at some of the lesser known characters in scripture, the the sidekicks a little bit more. Now, it has been brought to my attention that some of my illustrations last week were a little too modern for some of your palettes. That some in the, we shall call it more mature generation, had a hard time connecting. So with that in mind, Allow me, please, accept this as my olive branch to you. Heroes and sidekicks. Now, I do remember this first one, and if you're under 40, you won't. But for the rest of you, how many of you remember this guy? There it is. Old people are like, yes, black and white, the way we liked it. This next one predates even this guy, these two. That's going, that was colorized, because this was 1969. Who is it? Butch Cassidy. Cassidy. There it is. There it is. So if you're over 140, you knew that one. Way to go, Dave. Let's pull it back into my lifetime. Now, the thing is, not only heroes get sidekicks, villains also get sidekicks. And this is the best duo there is. <laughs> yes. Doctor. Doctor Evil. And Mini Me. So good. So good. So last week we talked about a sidekick. We talked about Ananias. There's only 10 verses in the scripture that talk about him. It's in Acts chapter 9. He's the one who is instrumental in leading Paul in those first couple days, Saul who would become Paul. And we talked about how Ananias made himself first available to God. By making himself available, he was in position to do something. So it was good, and then not only was he available, but he was obedient. He was obedient even when he had some eh, reservations. And availability And obedience yielded an incredible result. We saw with Ananias in his three days of ministry that Saul, who would become Paul, who would write two-thirds of the New Testament and lead hundreds of thousands, if not millions, to the faith, Paul was not only saved, but he was healed, he was baptized, he was spirit-baptized, all in a couple days at the ministry of Ananias. God can use anyone. And we came up at the end on our our verse for the series, and you're going to hear this every week, and this is important. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says this, and I got the good version this week. It says, for we are his masterpiece. We're his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Look at, look at that person on your right, on the left. Husbands, look at your wife. Tell her, you are a masterpiece. Wives, look at your husband and say, you're a piece of work. <laughs> Loosely translated, it's the same. All right? <laughs> Scripture says we're his masterpiece. Every brushstroke from the master painter perfectly laid down, no mistakes, no oops. You are the masterpiece of God and he has prepared from the foundation of the world before you were even a thought 
in your mommy and daddy's mind. He had prepared a work for you. You're his masterpiece. You have something to do. This verse reminds each of us, I don't care if you're young or old, male or female, doesn't matter. You have value and you have a purpose. Don't forget that. Doesn't matter what season of life you're in, doesn't matter what you're going through, what you're experiencing. You have value because you're his masterpiece. His name is signed in the bottom. You have value and you have a purpose. There is a whole generation today, multiple generations, who, who don't know their value and can't find their purpose. God gives us both. Amen? Masterpiece. Masterpiece. All right, this week we're getting to another sidekick, another background character, a bit role if ever there was a bit role. So let's do a little historical context. The nation of Israel hits its peak spiritually, powerfully under King David. It is strong, it is doing well. Despite David's flaws, and he certainly had them, he went on to serve God faithfully, and the nation of Israel was strong. And he handed the kingdom off to his son, Solomon. I'm a Bible nerd. Most of you know that I'm a Bible nerd, but let me tell you how nerdy I am. A couple years ago, we were studying kings here. We were going through First and Second Kings, and we were looking at the nation of Israel. And if you remember... Our Wednesday night Bible study, we, we started in Genesis. We just went through. So we heard this whole incredible story on how God brought his people up and he led his people out. He delivered them with miracle after miracle. And now under King David, they're at this pinnacle. They are serving God as a nation. They are doing well. They're prospering. They have peace and they're enemies on all sides and they've occupied the promised land that God gave him, and everything is great. And then Solomon. And I remember, as we were studying this in depth, just feeling almost like sick to my stomach, seeing everything that God had done for them. And in one generation... From David to Solomon, in one generation, everything began to fall apart. Oh, there's probably a sermon in there somewhere. Today, as we get into our sidekick, the nation of Israel has separated. They divided, they fell into civil war, the northern and the southern kingdom. And even then, they weren't following God. It's not like one group was really spiritual and the other were nasty pagans. No, they were both pretty bad. The northern kingdom, which would be called Israel, was the worst and had some of the worst kings ever. So far from God, so much idol worship, all intermixed with, with, different, with different religions and different countries and terrible. The southern kingdom, known as Judah, was a little better, but not great. And ultimately, God is going to send his judgment on both the northern and southern kingdom, or we'll just call them Israel as a whole, from foreign nations would come in and conquer them. So this is where we are in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 5, we're about 725 years before Jesus comes on the scene. Things in Israel, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, not good. A nation that was built by the hand of God had just whew, fallen off a cliff. And now these foreign enemies are coming in, having their way. As we pick up 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about a man named Naaman, not the hero, not the sidekick, just a guy. And he was an Assyrian, foreigner. And this is what we read. 2 Kings 5, 1, Naaman, commander of the, army, of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him 
the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Naaman, commander of the Syrian army, and God would use the Syrian army, a pagan army, God would use them to bring judgment on his children. Scripture tells us he was favored in the kingdom. A military commander of his rank in that day would basically be second to the king. If he wanted to, the army would support him in an overthrow. In fact, in ancient times, it was many times the commander of the army who would take over and become king. So here we see this man named Naaman, mighty man of valor. Jewish history, some rabbis teach, again, for you Bible nerds, that it was Naaman who fired the famous bow shot that struck Ahab and killed King Ahab. Whether or not that was true, we don't know. That wasn't in the Bible, but some Jewish texts tell us this. So Naaman was a big deal for the Syrian army, but we're told he had leprosy. Now, we know a little bit about leprosy from the Old Testament, and the nation of Israel had some guidelines to prevent the spread of leprosy. Leprosy, very infectious, skin disease. We don't think about it a lot now because it's been virtually eliminated from Western culture, but that's not the case everywhere. There's still leper colonies where people have this disease. And what the Israelites were mandated to do by God is if you had leprosy, you had to be isolated. You would be taken from your family and put outside the city. And this is where this leper colony idea comes from because you couldn't be around anyone healthy because they had no means by which to protect anyone. So for Israelites, they knew how how serious leprosy was. Well, the Syrians also knew this. However, they didn't have the same guidelines. God told the Israelites what to do. The Syrians, I don't know what they did because their lead head commander who was going out in battle was a leper. And he had leprosy. So here we find him. And this account involves God eventually healing Naaman through Elisha, the prophet. But neither Elisha or Naaman are the characters we're going to study. 2 Kings 5, verse 2. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So the scripture tells us one of the the captives that were taken from Israel, and we've seen this pattern elsewhere in scripture when Israel would be conquered, the surrounding nations would would take some of the best and brightest and leave the rest either dead or in poverty, but they would take the best back to, to their homeland. And one of these captive girls sees that Naaman has leprosy and she's serving Naaman's wife. And she says, I wish that Naaman we'd go see Elisha, the prophet in Samaria, because my God can heal leprosy. Well, there's no other cure for leprosy. There's nothing else for them to do. Naaman hears this. He's so moved, he goes to the king, says, hey, what do you say I go down to Samaria? We've already conquered them. We'll see if I could find this guy and get some help. You could read the rest of 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman ends up going down there. The king gets this letter, the the king of Israel, saying, I'm sending my commander down here so you could fix his leprosy. And the king is like, what? Like, is this like a threat? I I can't fix, what is he thinking? He's going to die here just like he would die there. And, And he didn't know how to take this. But Elisha, the prophet, gets wind of this and he says, send him to me. So Naaman eventually makes his way to where Elisha is. And Elisha sends out a servant to greet him. Elisha doesn't leave the house. (laughs) 
Elisha doesn't get off the couch. Elisha is watching the golf tournament, and he's like, yeah, would you go take care of that? Thanks. And here comes Naaman, the second most powerful man in that region, and he is used to, when he shows up, everybody comes out, and they line the street, and they, they bow before him, and they show him honor and respect. Elisha doesn't even get off the couch and sends a servant, and the servant goes, yeah, hey, Naaman, just go dip seven times in that river, you'll be all set. Naaman is furious. The disrespect. Why would I come here to dip in your, we have better rivers back in Syria. I don't need to be here. This is, this is foolishness. And <coughs> Naaman's servant says, hey, commander, if, if the prophet told you to do something difficult, you would have done it. How much more if he told you something, something easy? So Naaman gets over it, long story short, dips seven times, comes up totally clean, cured of leprosy. Our sidekick for this morning is all the way back in verse two. And her name is a certain girl. <laughs> Whew, the prestige in that title. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. So this morning, we're gonna do a Bible study on a little girl. She doesn't even get a name. Star Wars fans, you got any Star Wars fans in the house? Those last three movies were atrocious, but in any case, in Star Wars, all the troopers, the stormtroopers were clones and they didn't have names, they had numbers. So in the last three movies, we're introduced to FN2187. And he had no name, but the guy saw FN. He's like, oh, we'll call you Finn. So that's a terrible name, but it's fitting because it was a terrible movie. In any case, <coughs> no name, no importance. Just there, just a person, just another one to be counted in. This girl has no name, has no identity that we're given in scripture, but we learn a couple things about her. As for her status, it wasn't great. As far as sidekicks go, she's not doing super. If you were to look at the pecking order in ancient Israel and ancient times, and you were to go to the lowest of the lowest, you would be dealing with a young slave, prisoner of war, girl. Don't get all sexist on me. I don't make the rules. That's just how it was. As far as having as low of a social status as you could have, she checked all the boxes. She was young. She was a prisoner of war. She was a servant in a foreign country. And, and she was a girl. <sighs> That meant she didn't know how to drive. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So jo I'm joking. They didn't drive then. I'm going to pay for that later. She was as low on the pole, the totem pole, as you can be. She had no clout, no prestige. In fact, in scripture, we don't even get her name. Just, just a little girl who was taken captive. She was from the northern kingdom. That was the worst of the two, the, the more ungodly of the two. But as we know, even in an ungodly kingdom, there's remnants of those who were still faithful. You could have an ungodly king. You could have uh, a government that is very far from God, but there remains a remnant of people who are faithful to God. Amen? I hope. <laughs> So there were still those who were faithful in the northern kingdom, and clearly, as we're going to see, she was from one of those families. And we're going to look at her, her superpowers a little bit. As a sidekick here, we're going to look at her faithfulness to God and how she stood out despite what was going on around her. So the first thing for us to notice, with, I, I wish she had a name that I could call her. The first thing that we're going to notice with this girl, how condescending, uh, in the middle 
of incredible adversity, she keeps her faith in God. Now, how many of you remember Daniel? Book of Daniel, taken captive as a young boy, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fiery furnace, okay? This was the routine. They would take the young people, they would bring them back, in this case, to Assyria, teach them the Assyrian culture, put them to work. The ones who were really good would get in better positions. The ones who weren't so good were doing other things. And this was their way of expanding their empire by bringing in the next generation and indoctrinating them. Oh, that's a sermon. And indoctrinating them. You can preach that. You have my permission if you want to run with that. Um, to, their, to their culture and to their customs. So we saw this with Babylon and Daniel. This is happening now with the Syrians and, and this little girl. She's been taken. Her family is taken from her. We don't know if she's an orphan. We don't know if her family was killed. We know they weren't with her. We don't know if her family was just left behind, uh, destitute and poor. They, they didn't want them because they were older. We don't know if they were killed, but she's taken away from her family, from her friends. She's taken away from her, her home and her home probably one of the few in the northern kingdom where faith was important to them. She was taken away from her faith. She was taken away from everything that was comfortable. And she was put all by herself in the middle of this pagan foreign land with no support, with no encouragement, with, with no girlfriends to be like, oh, hang in there, girl. <laughs> hang in there, certain girl. <laughs> Nothing, all on her own in the middle of this, yet we're going to see that her faith in God remained unshaken. This alone is incredible. I know believers who have a hard time following Jesus when 99% of the things in their life are going great. And just like one thing goes wrong and they're a wreck and they fall apart. She had everything fall apart. She lost everything. She was relocated. She was nothing. Yet she held on to her faith. In 2 Timothy 13, or 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, Paul's talking to Timothy about what to preach and what to share and how to invest in the next generation. And he says, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. One of these things we find out here is she had some awesome parents. She had some parents who raised her strong in the faith, so strong that when everything was taken away from her, she was still standing. That's impressive. That's pretty good. Maybe, maybe her father was one of the 7,000 who never bent his knee and bowed to, to Baal back with King Ahab and when uh, Elijah was there. Maybe, maybe the mother was, was there and maybe they witnessed when Elijah called down fire from heaven and they saw how God moved. Whatever the case was, her parents raised her right. And even when they were out of the scene, when she was removed, and when adversity was all around her, she continued to stand strong. That's pretty good. That's worth noting. Another thing that we know about her, I don't know how much of a superpower it is, but she served. She served. Her job wasn't very glamorous. She's making beds. She's sweeping. You ever ask your kids to sweep and they just push the dirt into the corners of the room like completely useless. She was sweeping the right way. In fact, she must have had some success because she finds herself as, as a, a maid in the house of Naaman, who's basically second in command, commander of the armies. She's the, the maid to his wife. 
She even talks to and, and has some kind of a relationship there. She served and she served well. How unspiritual, making beds, sweeping floors, maybe cooking a little. What what a small task in light of the entirety of the kingdom of God. But what do we find here? We find that as she's faithful in the insignificant things, God gives her the opportunity to make a significant impact. There's something about being faithful in the little things. There's something in being faithful in just the the day-to-day, just living your life the way you're supposed to and representing Jesus. You didn't jump up on your desk at work and shout across the cubicles, repent and be saved. No, you didn't do anything like that. But you did your job really well. And when you were supposed to be there at eight, you were there at five to eight. They don't count church attendance, you're safe, relax. As Christians, you've heard me say this multiple times, we should be the best workers there are. Because the word of God says, whatever our hand finds to do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. So our witness is our work ethic. Our witness is how we carry ourselves. As she was sweeping floors and fixing beds and taking care of what what could only be called menial little tasks around the household, her faith was on display. So much so that it opened up a door for her to speak and to speak into the life of Naaman's wife, and eventually Naaman. Jesus is talking to Matthew 25, 23, and he gives us this this statement and this principle. Talking about the master and the servants, and the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Because you are faithful in the little things, I'll promote you to greater things. Jesus builds off this and he shares it multiple times in the New Testament. And one of the times he he puts this twist on it. When he comes back to the servants and those who had performed well, and this is very not woke. This is very, uh, very against what, what our world teaches. Jesus would have been very unpopular. He said this, take to the one, from the one who has a few and give it to the one who has more. <laughs> because this one proved to be a good steward. So we're going to take yours away and give it to them. And they'll have even more now. Jesus was talking about rewards for faithfulness. And when you're faithful in the little things, it opens up a door to some more important things. And that's exactly what we're gonna see here. Because of her faithfulness, because she kept working and she worked as unto the Lord, they began to see something in her. Listen, friend, you might not feel like you're doing much for the kingdom right now, but don't underestimate what God can do through your faithfulness. Don't underestimate how God can use you in a foreign land, all by yourself, with with no other believers around you. Don't underestimate how powerful your witness can be, even in the little things. And here's another thing she learned. Be fruitful in the season that you're in. Just, Just be fruitful. Whatever you are, whatever you're doing, wherever you find yourself, whatever hardship, adversity, struggle, whatever is going on in your world right now, just remember, even there, you can be fruitful. So here's the door that God opens up to her. Because of her faithfulness in adversity, because she humbled herself and served, God 
gives her influence. And the influence was simply this. When Naaman is sick and he gets this disease, she speaks Jesus. She speaks healing. She speaks about her God and inserts him into the conversation. She has influence. Naaman, this great commander of the army, would go on and listen to her. She would speak to Naaman's wife, and maybe it was like an Esther moment. If you remember the story of Esther, and she has to go before the king, and should I go? If I go, he might kill me. I don't know. What should I do? And she pretties herself up, and she, she goes before the king, and the king honors her. Maybe she had the same kind of back and forth. We don't know. Do I say anything? I'm just a slave. I'm a foreigner. I'm a little girl. She probably doesn't even know my name, but she takes a stand. And God gives her influence. 1 Peter 2.12 tells us this. This is so good. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. That's good. Live such a good life before those who don't know God, that even though they accuse us, you crazy, holy roller, you hateful, transphobic, homophobic, every phobic, awful people, even though they accuse us, live such good lives that God would be glorified. That's what she did. And God gave her influence. Now, each week as we have gone through this, we have, to, we have to address the kryptonite. We all remember what kryptonite is. We don't know our Bible stories, but we remember the fake metal from the fake planet that caused weakness to the fake superpower man, Superman there, right? We remember kryptonite. That, that was the thing that, that hurt him. And there's some kryptonite in this story that could have absolutely left this little girl powerless, unable to do anything for the Lord. So let's look a little bit at a couple of these kryptonite type situations. The first one would be adversity. Adversity can be kryptonite. Adversity can cause us to shut it down. Just don't want to do anything. Men, are you listening to me? I'm talking to you. That's our thing. Things go bad, we shut it down. Go in the basement, turn on Sports Center, talk to me in three weeks, just leave me alone, don't want to deal with anything. Ladies, sometimes you handle it differently, and sometimes maybe that's your thing too. We either shut it down completely or we tell every single person we can find about our problems. All of them on Facebook, social media. Such a rough day, dot, 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 post. <laughs> Looking desperately for some attention. So either we want no attention or we want bad attention. But sometimes in adversity, we allow the adversity to just further mar that image of God in our life. And we use our adversity as an excuse. Well, I can't serve God because of this. Or if you know what I was going through, or if you heard about my problems, or if you knew what I had to deal with, and it begins to sour us, it changes our heart. We look at other people and we're like, you don't even know what difficulty is, loser. It impacts us. Our response to adversity can either show Jesus or it could hurt his work in our life. Don't let adversity be your kryptonite. Don't let the difficulties that you're facing dim the light that Jesus wants to shine through your life. Remember this morning and every morning, God is greater than your problems. 
God is greater than what you're facing. God is greater than your situation, your difficulties, your circumstances. Aren't you glad this morning God is greater than your hurts? God is greater than your sickness. God is greater than your past. Hallelujah. Our God is good. Don't let adversity dim your light. It's not an excuse, believer. We continue to shine. Adversity certainly could have been her kryptonite. Another kryptonite for her that could have been a huge deal. Insecurity. Insecurity. I'm just a kid. I'm just a little slave girl. I'm not important. I have nothing to offer. I can't help anybody. How can God possibly use me? We've heard this story before in scripture. We've heard others question Oh, God, I'm the least of my clan and the youngest and the smallest, and, and I'm not good enough. And, and again and again and again, we see the hero in every story. Every story. It's not Paul. It's not Elijah. The hero in every story is God. And the people are just flawed, broken. They have a past. They didn't feel good enough. They didn't feel up to the task. They didn't feel like they were smart enough. They didn't think God can use them. But God, the hero in every story, uses small, insignificant, broken, flawed people just like you and I. God's the hero, and God will use anyone if you let him. Don't think that you have nothing to offer. Don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, how could God possibly use me? And you begin to list all the things you've done. God can't use me because of my past. I have no talents. I have no abilities. I have nothing to offer. We said last week, the best ability is availability. When you make yourself available to God, God will use you powerfully. If you're living and you're breathing today, God can use you. He's not done with you yet. Young person, God ain't done with you. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. Old person, the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid fans, God's not done with you. If he was done with you, you wouldn't be here. We can retire from our job and check that box, but we'd never retire from our purpose. And as long as we are on this earth, God can use us. Make yourself available. Don't make excuses. Don't be insecure. It's not about what you're going through or where you've been or what you've been. Make yourself available. Let God use you. The last kryptonite, the biggest the worst. This is a sermon all by itself. Unforgiveness could have derailed this train before it ever got started. They went to her home. They destroyed the place. They took her from her family. They took her from her friends She didn't have any connections. She didn't know anybody. They tried to teach her false religion and false gods and foreign customs. She could have held that in her heart. When Naaman got leprosy, she'd have been like, yeah, my prayers have been answered. Die of leprosy, you pagan. Because that's where unforgiveness puts you. But somewhere In this little girl's journey, she was able to forgive the very people who put her in this position. We remember Jesus hanging on the cross, nails in his hands and in his feet. And with some of his final words, he looked at the people who put him there. And he says, Father, forgive them. This little girl to the very people who put her in that situation, shows forgiveness. 
And how do we know she showed forgiveness? Because she extends God's love to them when she could have withheld it. What does she say? Hey, my God is bigger than leprosy. My God can touch your husband. If you go see the prophet back in my land, my God is able. That's not the the mouth of someone who hates their enemy. That's someone who's forgiven. Someone who's showing the love of God, even in the middle of difficult circumstances. Unforgiveness. Church, unforgiveness. Don't let unforgiveness be your kryptonite. Don't hold on to something because what happens is it changes you. You've heard the quote, I've shared it multiple times, bitterness is the poison you drink while you wait for someone else to die. That's unforgiveness. You hold on to that unforgiveness. They don't, the person you're mad at might not even know. You're up at night losing sleep. They're sleeping great. They have no idea. You're angry and you're bitter, but you come to church, so you gotta play it off like you're not really angry and bitter. So you just kinda eat it and stuff it in. But it hurts, and it hurts on the inside. And then something else happens. I don't want to strangle this guy, but I can't strangle people. Jesus says, thou shalt not strangle. So I'm just going to eat it. I'll be fine. But in your heart, you don't forgive. And your heart begins to get hardened. And it's really hard to show God's love with a hard heart. And this is why Jesus tells us repeatedly, forgive, let it go. Trust me with it. Lay it at the altar. This is why Jesus tells us, if you want your Father in heaven to forgive you, you have to forgive people. He wasn't making that a condition for salvation, but he was saying, as followers of Jesus, you and I, who have been forgiven for so much, it would be unnatural for us to not forgive. Oh, but pastor, you don't know how they hurt me. You don't know what they said. They're not even sorry. The Bible makes no no exceptions. Forgive. Let that forgiveness flow through you because when you do, your heart stays soft and God can use a soft heart. A lot of people have been hurt. Everybody has been hurt. If you forgive, your heart remains soft. If you don't, your heart gets really hard. She could have, she could have hated these people. She could have been poisoning their food. She could have been setting traps for them to, to trip and hurt themselves. But instead, she is extending and showing the love of Jesus only A forgiving heart can do that. If you're here this morning and you have been hurt and you have every reason in the world to hold that grudge and it might feel good because our flesh is weird like that. But you know what? Jesus wants you to be free from that. Don't let unforgiveness be the kryptonite that dims your light, that causes you to be ineffective for his kingdom that robs those around you that God wants to speak to. It robs them of that blessing because your heart is hardened. Don't don't fall into that trap. Make sure your heart is free completely from unforgiveness. I'll ask the worship team to join me as we wrap it up this morning. Because of this girl, Naaman, the leper, is healed. Because of how she carried herself, because of her faith, God honored her and God used her. And in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is talking and he kind of, sort of mentions it. Kind of. Sort of. Humor me. Luke 4, 27, Jesus is talking with the religious leaders. And he says, there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, 
only Naaman the Syrian. 800 years later, this little girl's in heaven. She hears the Son of God reference this, and she's like, hey, hey, that was me. I was the one who told him. I said, go, go, because my God is bigger than leprosy. Go, go see the prophet. My God can do this. God used her, and we still don't know her name because it's not important because she's not the hero, God is. And in your life, let God be the hero. Let God use you. Let God work through you. You might think it's impossible. You might think you have nothing to offer. Be faithful like last week. Be available in obedience. Don't let unforgiveness creep in. Be who God has called you to be and let the light of Jesus shine through you. God can use you. The people that the world writes off as insignificant, unimportant, they don't even know your name, but God can use you. In the middle of your adversity, in a difficult season, God can still use you. You're not too small. You're not too insignificant. Your past doesn't define you. Unforgiveness doesn't sit in your heart, you let it go. You let it go. As we close this morning, I, I want to pray over you and I'll have the worship team come out. And we close every Sunday pretty much the same way. We just open the altar for those who want prayer. And if you just want a time to connect with God or you want someone to pray for you, we'll have our altar workers up here and we'll be, we'll be here to pray with you. Or maybe you just want to kneel and, and spend a few moments but I want to challenge you this morning. What is God speaking to your heart? We come to church not just to hear about God's word, not just for information. We come for transformation. We want to be changed. We want to be more like Jesus. We want him to transform us. You, you leave here smarter because of what you heard, but we want to leave here changed. So the question you ask yourself this morning you ask it to God, you pray it to God. Father, what are you showing me? God, what is it in my life that you're trying to speak to me this morning? Maybe you feel insignificant, like no one knows who you are. Maybe you're in the middle of adversity and you can't see anything but your own pain. But God wants to use you. Maybe you're here today and you've been carrying some unforgiveness and it's hurting you. It's hurting your relationships. It's hurting people who didn't even do anything to you because you're so hurt from the last one. You're hurting on the inside. That unforgiveness is just there. Your heart is hard. You gotta let that go. Let Jesus heal you of that. Leave that at the altar this morning and let God give you that new heart. And that same forgiveness we receive we extend. And that's supernatural, folks. That's, that's not something you can muster up in, in your goodness. That's a gift from God. Maybe you're here this morning and, and your relationship with Jesus simply is not what it should be. And you know it and you want to make that right. And this is your opportunity to do that. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you don't know of his love for you. I'll have the altar workers come and take their spots. There'll be men and women up here who would love to pray with you, to pray for you, to put your faith in Jesus Christ. What is God showing you? What is God teaching you? What is he speaking to your heart? As the worship team comes, stand together with me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word and thank you for the valuable lessons of your word that remind us that when we're weak, you're strong. And when we feel powerless, you are powerful. And Lord, there's no situation you can't use and there's nothing that you can't break through. God, we invite you this morning, be the hero in our story. God, be the hero in our emotions. Be the hero in our forgiveness. Be the hero in our attitude this morning. Lord, in every area of our lives, 
Let Jesus shine through us. God, for those who are hurting this morning, Lord, show them your power. Father, for those burdened, saddled with unforgiveness, let your grace and mercy wash us clean, wash us new. Father, restore our hearts. Jesus, let your light shine through your church to a world that desperately, desperately needs to see it. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. If you need to respond this morning, let's come. Let's spend some time with the Lord as we close. Our God, the battlefield.